tengo comentarios. Muchas gracias, Helen. I will switch to English now to introduce our speaker. Good morning, good afternoon, Jeff. It, it is my very great pleasure to welcome and introduce Professor Jeff, Professor Jeff Hearn. Uh, Jeff Hearn is an expert in gender studies who works on masculinity with an intersectional perspective. He is, among other titles and professorships, he is a, he is a, a senior professor in gender studies at Örebro University in Sweden. He's also a professor emeritus at Hanken School of Economics in Finland. And he also holds other positions in, uh, in other universities in the UK, South Africa, Sweden. And he's a fellow of the Academ Academy of Social Sciences in UK. His topic of research focuses mainly in, on gender, sexuality, violence, work, organization, management policy and transnational processes. He has authored several books about men and masculinities, including the most recent ones entitled Does Knowledge Have a Gender? and the just published Age, of, Age at Work with uh, Wendy Parkin. He is an editor and co-editor of book series such as Rutledge Advances in Feminist Studies and Intersectionality. And we met uh, last year at, at, at an EMBO conference on gender roles and their impact on academia, where he spoke about gender in the workplace and society. So I'm very pleased that he joins us today. He's uh, in Finland. So good afternoon again, Jeff. And welcome. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours, Jeff. Thank you, Victoria. I just double check. You can all hear me, okay, more or less. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sitting in Helsinki. The snow outside. It's about zero degrees. And uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, Victoria, and your colleagues for this kind invitation, also for the kind introduction. And as you say, we we met uh, online. That is, at the EMBO conference last year. Um, one of these many conferences online. And I think I want to say also. And this, I mean, the, I'm not sure if it's the happy position or the unhappy position <laughs> that I've, I've never, I'm afraid, been to Latin America. I've been to Africa a lot, but my knowledge, I know where Uruguay is because geography was my, was my first degree uh, at university. So I, knew, <laughs> I know where places are in the world. But, um, and my knowledge of biotechnology and molecular biology is very, very, very small. So I'm an ignorant person. And I'm going to talk to you about men and masculinities. And I'm going to try and share my screen now, which just to double check, it is functioning OK. Can someone just confirm that? Yes. Is that yes. right? OK. So I have the title, do men and masculinities, do they or we matter for gender equality in research and academia? And I'm going to try and talk for about 35 minutes. I'll probably fail. <laughs> because I tend to talk too long and I always have many or quite a lot of PowerPoints and I won't like read at all. I will talk to some of the PowerPoints. I prefer that. And then also, if you want to, I will send the PowerPoints later to Victoria and you can share them uh, and so on. Okay, so today the topic is men. That's what we're gonna talk about, what I'm gonna talk about. And when one says men, it might seem a strange topic to, <laughs> to focus on. And depending on who you are and what gender you are or how you identify, it can mean very different things. It can be something about your very being, if you're a man. It can be to do with the work that you're involved in. It can be to do with what you might call politics and policy. And also it can be to do with research and theorizing. It's a multi, if you like, sided aspect. And I take it for granted that you all know and understand that gender inequalities persist in research and in academia and in science. And the point is that when many people start talking about gender equality in science, for both good and you could say not so good reasons, the talk usually shifts to talk about women and girls, which is quite understandable and quite right. And sometimes this is also about the notion of that 
women and girls have to change in order to, to advance in science and academia. Sometimes it's also framed around what we might call gender mainstreaming as the solution. But it's not so often actually the focus is on men, on men and boys, although boys are often the subject around failing boys in some countries in schools. So this is turning things around in terms of what happens if you think about men and changing men in terms of changing and reducing inequalities in science and academia and research. And this affects us all, I think, in different ways. And there are various ways of talking about this. One way which may or may not resonate or capture your attention is to talk about an absent presence. You know, everyone knows about this. Men are, are present very much, but are often a kind of invisible absence. Or another way of talking about it is hidden in plain sight. <laughs> that makes sense. And so you might imagine it's actually hard to talk about gender equality without actually engaging with men and masculinities. And I mean, I, I, I live in Finland and I'm within the European Union and there are many excellent documents published by the EU, by the European Commission on this topic, many, but actually very few engage with issues around men and masculinities. And one can ask the question, you know, will gender inequality change in science and research without changing men uh, and masculinities? It seems actually a little bit unlikely. Just if you're interested in issues around ethnic or racial relations that involve change in white people, not only change in, in people of color, black and minority ethnic people. And as it says at the bottom of this, this PowerPoint, if you can see it, I mean, naming men as men in academia may seem obvious, but it can all still be, and I've been working in this area actually since the late 70s, um, which is quite a long time ago now, thinking about it. Um, it, still, it still is kind of like a, an odd or an awkward or even an uncomfortable topic to actually put on the table and have a focused discussion on, whether it's like now where I'm talking at you, so to speak, or whether it's a discussion you might have in your research team or your research group or your work group and so on. And of course, this raises the question, what is a man? Which I'm not gonna go into in this moment, but I want you just to reflect on this basically for a moment. What counts as a man or what counts as masculinity? And this does, of course, vary in different parts of the world. Or what is a real man? You know, what is a very real man? Um, so, to get to the topic, you know, do men matter for gender equality in research and academia? And where do men fit into this, this whole question? Um, what has it got to do with you if you're a man or which kind of man or if you're a woman or if you're further gender? And which men are we talking about? You know, men come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This is an interesting picture from a Swedish photographer called Arito Bustrom, who lives in London, Stockholm and Los Angeles. Um, and of course, images of men are everywhere, okay? Of different kinds, of many, many different kinds. And the topic of men and masculinity is now figures, I don't know how it is in Uruguay, um, but in many parts of the world, there is now quite a, a strong popular media discussion. There is even political debate. As I've said, there's policy development and there is rather a large research area, which I'm not gonna go into here particularly, um, but it's an area in terms of my working life, I, I work within what partly at least in what's often called critical studies on men and masculinities within gender studies, which is particularly strong in parts of some social sciences. And basically it's looking at how men and masculinities are or vary in different parts of the world, historically, over the life, life course. As you get older, I'm very interested in age as well, as was mentioned by Victoria, and how gendered power works for men and masculinities, how some men gain massively, some men lose out, and how these things intersect, as it's, as it's called, with other things, class, age, sexuality. This is a whole nother, there are about 15 specialist academic journals on critical work on men and masculinities, just as a kind of aside, but I'm putting that to one side. And this is something I wrote actually <laughs> in 1987, uh, when I was younger, um, 
about reasons for men to, to engage in gender change. What are the material reasons for men to change against patriarchy? Now, it, it, the possibilities of love, emotional support and care for and from other men, to change relations between men, change relations with children, change relations with women, improved health for men. A lot of men have rather bad health. Transforming work, avoidance of violence from other men. So men do more violence than women. That's been demonstrated repeatedly, I mean, historically and now and during COVID as well, unfortunately. But also there's violence, a lot of violence between men as well. Okay, this is a little triangle that I, I it, it was designed uh, in the mid nineties by Mike Mesner in the US, but it's quite useful. It's about why or why should men get interested or bothered about gender equality, or you could also add feminism and other progressive movements. One way is, and I'm, look, I'm now looking at the bottom left-hand corner, is to look at the costs that come to masculinity and some men from a gender unequal society. Health is one, as I mentioned already. Violence from other men is another one. Maybe bad relations with family members, if any at all. And then one has, in a sense, going to the bottom right-hand corner, the issue of differences between men. I've already mentioned a few differences. Not all men are the same. Variations by age, by class, by sexual identity, by migration, by skin color, we can go on and on. So difference is a very important motivation to say things should change. And I'm interested in that particular change. That's where I'm coming from. And then there's the top of the triangle, the so-called social justice position in terms of stopping or reducing men's privileges in terms of social justice, just as there are many other social justice movements across the world. And it took now, now we get, <laughs> that's my little introduction. Now we get some sense to try and think about some of these implications of this for um, what m most or maybe all of you are doing in terms of research, academic work, academic work, science, scientific work, and so on. And I'm just gonna really try and focus on three things. One is changing men and masculinities in what you might call everyday gender equal interactions. What we do, like when we say hello to somebody, or even should we say, many women report just simply being ignored. I don't know how it is in Uruguay, but walking along the corridor, just being ignored. So what goes on day to day? Another one, is changing man masculines in terms of gender equal management and organizations and control of resources, who gets the resources and so on. And the third one, which is the most difficult, I think actually, and particularly bearing in mind my ignorance about biotechnology is changing men and masculines in terms of gender equal research content, the actual content of research. I mean, this is perhaps more obvious if you're studying, if you say history, or even psychology, but how this works in your own fields, I am pretty ignorant. Okay, so just take each of these in turn. Men and masculines in terms of everyday interactions, in both in the corridor, over coffee, if you like, by the photocopying machine or whatever, <laughs> a printer machine, the, and in the doing of research. And so this is about the dynamics of research teams, of projects, what you might call little mini local cultures, maybe a group of say six researchers, maybe referred to as a kind of family, which and families take many different kinds, including very oppressive ones. It may be like sort of gangs. Uh, quite a lot of research involves very sporty mini cultures between often younger men and some younger women. How does this relate to homosociality, which I'll come back to a bit later. Uh, LGBTIQA plus issues. This is referring to some work by my friend, colleague in the UK, Richard Collier, who tried to look at academia. He's actually a, a lawyer by profession. How it's possible to be both a man and an academic at the same time, if that makes sense. How you could actually sort of do being a man and being an academic. And he goes through a number of fairly jokey ways of talking about this. It's a serious topic, but so one is the nutty professor, a kind of classic stereotype, the administrator, the new entrepreneur, the predator, the young man in a hurry. This is a particular, particularly interesting one, I think, to want to get on <laughs> immediately. 
the aloof cynic who's cynical about everything, the academic couple, and so on. And this is just more or less his list, Richard's list. You could think about this in your own situation. These are some more which one can add on to. The, the, the man academic who is an active equality supporter or the supporter of equality who's more passive in principle, but not much more than that, if anything at all, or the unreconstructed academic in terms of gender. I, I, I've heard professors of social science saying how proud they are to know nothing about gender. This might sound really strange. It, it's like a sort of badge of honor not to know anything about it. The stealer of ideas, the going down, the, the, the non-researching research gatekeeper, that's an interesting category. Um, there are some men and of course some women as well who actually are not actually successful researchers, but actually have a lot of gatekeeping functions in terms of uh, research hierarchies and so on. Anyway, this is a, one way of thinking about what's going at the everyday level. I've mentioned already homosociality. I think homosociality not homosexuality, although that's a debate in itself, um, is a very important concept. It's a simple concept in some ways. It, it's basically, and this is taken from Jean Lippmann Blumen from the late seventies, I think, who talks about men or some men's greater valuation and preference for men and men's company, seeking enjoyment and preference for the same sex. Men are attracted to, stimulated by, and interested in each other. Men can and commonly do seek satisfaction for most of their needs from other men. And one of the ways in which it's, one can often demonstrate, and this is a paradox, being heterosexual, is to spend more time with men. That makes sense. It, it, this is a whole, it's, I think, it's, <clears throat> and this can be a very, Charlotte Holgerson, a colleague in Sweden, has written about this can be a very emotional moment actually, an emotional charge. It's quite hard to find the right language actually in English. It can involve emulation, imitation, it's emotional charge, even, even a, a, sometimes a sexual emotional charge between men, uh, even if certain men are actually individually dispensable in that situation. So it's a collective notion. I'm not gonna go through this. This is some work talking about some of the dangers, hogging the show, speaking capital letters, which is what I'm trying to avoid doing now, even though I'm doing it a bit. That's meant to be a slight ironic comment, just so you know. You know. Defensiveness, negativism, dogmatism, listening only to oneself, avoiding fear. These are the kind of, these things one can talk about in very down to earth ways, discuss them in work, in work groups, in uh, research teams and so on. Um, and similarly, tips for responsible action limiting our talking time, which today is not the case for me, not interrupting who is speaking, being a good listener. Further down the list, relaxing, which is also a good idea sometimes, actually, not speaking on every subject and so on. As also a slightly serious bit of humor, if you're interested, there's, a, there's a, a Finnish political scientist called Sara Sama, in Tampere University in Finland, who's designed a very interesting website, which is about all male panels in academia. It's on Tumblr, just go to it sometimes. It's, it's a serious, jokey website. It's examples of all male panels, okay? Is the world ready for global justice? Well, these men will tell you, okay? Uh, <laughs> Revolutionizing labor relations. Again, the, these men will tell you. There are lots and lots and lots. You can add to it. You can also post things yourself. Um, remembering all male panels is, is one way which academia works in conferences and, and even in local departmental discussions and so on. Okay, that's the, my first attempt to raise the everyday, if you like. The second one, is a bit broader. You might say it's more organizational. It's about management, resources, control of resources, who are the leaders, who are the project leaders, where do the resources go? There's a whole debate around excellence these days and centers of excellence. There's some interesting Swedish research, which actually has pointed out that the whole fashion for centers of excellence, which there is in many countries, isn't always 
sort of like might say the best use of money, putting it very simply, because what can happen, this has been studied and researched, is that certain very high productivity, often men researchers, then cluster around them other researchers who are not necessarily so productive, actually. So giving a lot of large uh, center of excellence money doesn't automatically, even in sort of strictly economic terms, actually work. And then you can ask what kind of leadership is there? I mean, I'm also involved in leadership studies in another hat, you might say. And there are obviously all sorts of heroic leadership, charismatic leadership, bureaucratic, authoritarian, paternalistic, facilitative, personalistic, where one uses one's personal skills, if you like, to facilitate. And increasingly, of course, virtual leadership is a major, major aspect of what's going on, especially during COVID and especially during international project leadership. So what leadership is done, this you can't really see, but it's just pointing out that when one looks at scientific boards, this is information from the EU countries, there's a huge variation even within Europe. I don't know the figures in Europe. I tried to find them actually in Uruguay, but I couldn't find them. But the variation of the proportion of women on scientific boards ranges from getting up to nearly 60%, 54% in Norway, down to really low, about 10% in some other countries, Cyprus and so on. And in terms of research gatekeeping in terms of Europe or EU actually, I should say, members of scientific boards range from, this is where you turn the figures around, not women, but men, okay? So 88% in Croatia, a mean average in the EU of three quarters basically, and the chairs from 100% in Croatia and Cyprus uh, with the EU average about 80. So what's the position in your situation, in your department? I, I have no idea really, but I mean, um, these are sort of structural, uh, realities in terms of gatekeeping and so on. There's a very interesting question, I think, of thinking about what's the connections between organizational, managerial leadership and gatekeeping practices and fit those kind of figures and what you might call the academic theoretical knowledge practices, if it makes sense. They're not two separate things. And putting it very simply, I think, the greater domination by men the more likely it is to be presented as gender neutral and the more homosocial and the more likely it might appear gender neutral. There's a very interesting article published just last year by Begani et al in Science Advances, which and this is more or less the quote, those who think bias is not happening in their field tend to be the key drivers of it. High risk group, and this is both men and women, that can be readily identified uh, where discrimination persists, perpetuated by those who think it is not happening. There's a kind of paradox involved here. And the, the Begani, or Begani et al. article is worth uh, searching and, and, and having a look at in more detail. Again, a couple of more examples from the all-male panel. This is on gynecology, obstetrics, and infertility. Yeah, congratulations, you have an all-male panel from Austria. Right. Another one, this one is from Eindhoven, right, and so on. Right, now the third area I want to try and pick up on, I'm conscious of time, so I'm, I'm doing my best to <laughs> go through these issues. Uh, but I've already said, I think you've got the everyday realities of, of more gender equal practices around men and masculinity. You've got the organizational, the resource-based issues. But then one has the question in terms of academia of knowledge and knowledge construction. And, it links back, as I already said, to the impact of who controls research agendas and research resources. And also it links to the question of the ways in which research and of course jobs are evaluated. And I mean, this has become such a major big issue in, in many parts of the world with so many academics and fantastically good researchers basically in precarious or relatively precarious non non-long-term contracts, maybe six months, maybe one year, maybe three years, maybe five years, et cetera, et cetera. So when one starts thinking about the content, and this is where I, I really struggle in terms of, of your own focuses on biotechnology, but these are the kind of things that I think can be useful. I mean, one again is to repeat, what are the theories, approaches, and even methods that are promoted and which ones are ignored 
or even just out of fashion in research. How this works in your areas, I don't know. One way of thinking about this is to use history. I think, it, I think it's interesting, even in maybe basic teaching courses, to talk a bit about the history of disciplines, because it's so much easier to look at some of these issues going back, you know, well, it's sometimes even 10 years, but 50 years. How, you know, how was biotech developed as disciplinarily? Historically, you can see the gender divisions and the gender formation much more clearly than you can perhaps looking at things now. There's the naming of men and masculinities in research and in terms of actually um, what one is talking about. There's also deconstructing assumptions about men and masculinities. What, actually, like, actually, who is a man actually in fact, or who is male and what is masculinity as not being essentially one thing. There's the expression of what examples are used actually in one's, in one's work, particularly perhaps in teaching, this is perhaps most obvious. Um, are they stereotypical examples or are they, are they counter stereotypical? There's also the issue of more broader questions of societal power. Uh, I mean, I, perhaps I should say, I mean, I'm not involved in biotech at all, but I'm very involved in work on information technology and actually online violation. Uh, digital violation and digital violence uh, and the whole question of the relation between technology and humans is central question there I mean which I'm sure it is also in biotech and then there's also the question of support and respect for feminisms and gender research and gender studies which certainly figures in some form in many universities uh, not by no means all and then I think an era I've become increasingly interested in uh, is trying to gender the apparently non-gendered or ungendered. Uh, I mean, two examples are the financial system, both in universities, like budgets, but also, you know, global finance affects us all. Internationalization, what does internationalization actually mean? It means often universities talking to each other. So who represents those universities? Um, who, who are the sort of um, the front people or the front men, if you like, in inverted commas, in internationalization, is that another level of gendered uh, activity? And another prime example are debates on sustainability, I think, and, and there's a lot of material now being produced around men, masculinities and sustainability. There's a book about to be published called Men, Masculinities and the Earth, which is all about these questions in terms of sustainability, climate change, environmental degradation, and so on. Um, I think I have to mention here the work of Londa Schiebinger in the US. And for those who aren't familiar, I, I really recommend searching out Londa Schiebinger's website and even getting on the, the email list, which is very easy. And then she will send you every couple of weeks really interesting articles and uh, documents that are about this question, particularly in terms of research content, not only, but mainly in natural sciences, but also some more generally. And there's many, many examples, two that are just mentioned here. One is the famous case about the design of crash, um, crash test dummies. <laughs> it sounds a very funny phrase in English, uh, like pretend non-humans for testing out what happens in a car when you crash. And, and the point is that the early examples were, were not designed with pregnant women in mind, which is obviously very stupid, actually, and very dangerous. And there's a lot of, you can, if you just search this, you'll find online information on that innovation, that gendered innovation, which is the term used uh, by Londa Schiebinger and colleagues. Another example is around pain research. I'm, I'm no expert on pain research whatsoever, but certainly historically, a lot of the early work was done only on males. And that also is very, very problematic. And there's many other examples um, also, particularly in the sort of biological and medical field. Okay, this is just, this is getting into a bit more detail. Um, to also to illustrate some of the complexity, this is not quite a sort of, things are not so sort of either or. I mean, the first part here, if you can see roughly, is referring to a study done in the mid 2000s by Simmons of 168 life scientists. So I guess that's close to some of your areas, um, looking at clear differences and discrepancies in the rate of publication 
of women and men, particularly in early careers. That's very important, early careers. And that also affects subsequent, subsequent citations and also the whole debate around H, H indexes and how they often tend to correlate with quantity of output uh, rather than necessarily quality, but that's another complication and how that can affect women scientists evaluation subsequently, if that makes sense. There's a more recent report produced called the Gender in the Global Research Landscape, which actually looks at how men do publish, tend to publish on, on average is a very global way of looking at things, more research papers than women, but not evidence of whether this affects citation. So that this is a kind of more nuanced position and more recent, but also men more likely to collaborate internationally, slightly lower interdisciplinary research, slightly less interdisciplinarity, and also slightly somewhat more internationally mobile. So I mean, these are, so it's, it's a more complex picture than just saying people are like A or B, um, but it, it illustrates some of the complexities, I think. I also want to highlight, which I guess some of you are perhaps involved in, I don't know, DORA, all right? The Declaration, Declaration on Research Assessment. That's right, I think that's correct, yeah. And you can find this site very easily, which basically, is looking at different ways of assessment of academics and researchers, moving away from so-called traditional criteria, which are pretty simple-minded in some cases, to looking at a more, you might say, holistic picture, uh, including, should we say, citations rather than just impact factors, um, looking at alternative metrics, looking at how these issues relate to open access and data sharing and uh, social impact and so on. And that th th there's a published last year, uh, a text by Rice, Raffol, Inodis and Moa, specifically on biomedical sciences, which may be of interest to some of you as well. So this is again, I think a site worth looking at and different organizations sign up to this declaration as you may or may not know. Right, my final five minutes, if I'm still in, roughly in the time, <laughs> is what is to be done. Well, I mean, I hope, I hope at least all and most of the things I've been alluding to or mentioning, you know, have got implications um, for what needs to be done. I mean, without repeating, uh, there are implications for individual men and masculinities. I mean, how one behaves, uh, as I say, do men actually even sometimes notice women? Do they even say hello in the corridor? Do they interrupt? Do men uh, support in meetings, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And some of the lists I gave earlier are examples. Then there's the organizational level. And that I think ranges thinking about this from you know, research teams to departments and or institutes, which obviously can be large organizations in themselves to sometimes institutes or departments within whole universities and the changes that are necessary in, in raising up the question of where do men and masculinities fit in these debates, which ones are, if you like, helpful, which are facilitative of more gender equality and which ones are definitely not helpful actually reproduce gender inequalities. And then there are national debates and I think increasingly, and a much underdeveloped area actually, is the implications transnationally. I mentioned internationalization earlier. Um, it's a much harder issue to study as a researcher, but as I say, this isn't just about individual institutes or, or universities. It's about, if you like, partnerships between universities, increasingly chains of universities in the EU where I, where I live in Finland, you know, there are so many projects going on involving, you know, 10, 20 universities and so on. And this transnational aspect, I think is something has to be taken up much, much more seriously. I mean, I will say as an aside, there's some really interesting work going on in the study of business uh, on what's called global supply chains in capitalist business. And uh, this is, looking at these very kinds of issues I've been trying to talk about in global supply chains. They're not only about how individual businesses or companies 
actually develop more gender equal ways of doing things, but they're also about how global supply chains actually are also constructed in this way. So the transnational is a big challenge, I think, and increasingly so. Um, so what encourages men to get more involved in promoting gender equality in research? Well, I, I've already used this diagram, and one can think about this diagram, the triangle, both in terms of why get involved, do you say, in just being interested personally, but also why get involved, you might say, if you have a sort of um, a gender policy, gender equality committee or group or activist group in your department, you know, why get involved in that? But also it's relevant for doing research, actually, for, for doing better research, for stopping men's privilege, actually, in, in research, doing actually improve research is also about looking at differences, maybe neglected perspectives, which are played down or seen as being a bit old fashioned or a bit effeminate even, dare I say. And it also may involve, you know, changing pr uh, the prioritizations in terms of say, stopping long hours culture, um, changing competition in a very nasty way between men and so on. Many possible ways in engaging as allies with gender equality, the long hours culture just mentioned, academic masculinities, changing leadership cultures, resource allocation, teaching content, better relations between men, better relations with women and further genders. Again, stopping the all male panels and Sometimes you hear, oh, yes, we, we, we actually forgot about that. We forgot. <laughs> we forgot we were invited five men, you know, somehow. Non-gendered issues, or so-called policy in institutions around racialization, age, gender, sexuality, harassment, bullying, and even asking men, where do you stand? These are a few little resources, not you know, big resources, I should say. I mentioned already the DORA uh, website, she figures is specifically EU, but it's a very good model, I think, for looking at and seeing how it relates to your situation in, in Uruguay, which I don't know, I'm afraid. The Genport site, a project I was involved in myself some years ago, is worth searching a lot of information on natural science. The Gender Innovations work I've already mentioned, the Global Landscape Report, and then there is an online book called, sorry, no, also I missed out, the UNICEF project is just beginning now, on violence in higher education and universities. I'm involved in a small way. It's run, not run, sorry. It, it's a PI is in Urubu, um, along with many other uh, units. Uh, there's an online book published just last year called The Gender Sensitive University. It's online by Drew and Kavanagh, or Ka Canavan rather, editing. You can find it, see it for free, including a chapter on men and masculinities. And, uh, my first, my first, no, not my first, my, maybe my first question, maybe but my last question is, is also to think personally, you know, and this might sound such a bizarre question, you know, how, not for women, I don't think, but to ask a man, how is being a man actually, or woman, or further, I use the word further gender, not other gender, further genders, affected your career? Uh, I remember once I supervised a PhD that was on middle managers in further education, actually not higher education. At the end of the uh, interviews, the uh, doctoral researcher asked the question, so how has you being a man middle manager been affected by being a man? And it was a very, stra <laughs> very strange. The answers were really bizarre sometimes, like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Um, you understand? So, just asking, how has being a man, woman, for the affected your career? And how would your career have been different or a bit different or totally different perhaps if you had not been a man, woman, identifying with a further gender? When I say further gender, I mean, some people identify as, as, as intersex or trans or um, there are many, many, many categories now, particularly online. So these are just some simple questions you can either ask yourself or ask your colleague and see what happens next. Okay, that's my attempt to cover some things in 35 or so minutes, right. And I'm sorry, yeah, the right hand one is in yellow, it keeps changing. It says, uh, it's, an, it's another email, it says jeff.hearn jeff at oru.se, which is Urubra. We can see it. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. You're we welcome. Can... <laughs> <laughs> um,
So it's been great, Jeff. Um, yeah, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, well, let's see if we can have uh, some questions. We can make, perhaps Helen can repeat the ways of asking okay. questions okay. in Spanish. She will do it. Sí. Eh, Pueden pedir eh, la palabra, ¿verdad? Como levantar la mano, raise hand. Eh, y también pueden escribirla en el Q&A. Si las escriben en el Q&A, eh, nosotros las podemos leer. Los que están en YouTube también pueden escribir sus preguntas en el chat. Eh, y si alguien levanta la mano, eh, le damos la palabra para que puedan hacer la pregunta en vivo. There's a comment. Great talk. Nadia says. Well, I do. I do have a question for you to perhaps elaborate on the on the gatekeeper function. What what mm. what does that imply? Every in, in a little bit more detail. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say something which might. Uh, my partner, who's in the next room, is called Lisa Husu, is an expert on gatekeeping. <laughs> I almost feel like saying, in academia, almost felt like saying, Lisa, come and talk. Uh, but maybe, OK, if need be, I could ask it anyway. Uh, so if you're interested in gatekeeping, maybe you, it's good to email uh, Lisa Husu. The only complication is that Lisa's name is spelled with uh, two I's, so it's L-I-I-S-A. Otherwise, you won't find her. But I mean, gatekeeping, I think, is a very useful concept. Um, and of course, it's used also in other, other contexts, including uh, some, uh, I think, electronics and various other things. But I mean, it ranges, I think, from, you know, very everyday gatekeeping, in a sense, you know, it might be in a, in a meeting, like who controls the agenda of a meeting? Um, it might include in a sense, does the chair of the meeting actually facilitate the items everyone knows should be talked about? Or does the chair of the meeting act where they actually simply take every comment as, as a, an attack on themselves and so on? So that's like very sort of low key gatekeeping, but also it ranges right up to the control of national resource agendas. And that's why these figures that I showed with the the graph and, and from the EU figures, you know, where when you look at particularly scientific boards, um, national scientific boards, um, and often these are actually governmental or semi-governmental, um, either in terms of their composition or in terms of who chairs them, one's looking at some major structural inequalities in terms of men dominating those positions in many countries. Not all, I mean, I mentioned Norway, it was actually, there were, I think, more women, in fact, in the membership of the scientific boards, 54%, I seem to remember. So this is not like an, any kind of fixed rule, but certainly in many countries, there's been an assumption that the composition will be mainly men in these very, well, they're relatively powerful boards, allocating research money, and certainly chairing, and chairing, of course, as we know, can be, you know, have a major influence on the outcome. So, I mean, that, that's the range behind gatekeeping. And this is not to say, obviously not to say that all men be, behave badly and all women behave well when they're chairing meetings. That would be a totally stupid thing to say. But I think it's fair to say for, for a start, it, just at one level, it seemed, it's rather unfair to have such discrepancies. It's not a sort of just position, not the necessary need. I mean, I'm not, particularly necessarily in favor of being 50-50 for every purpose, but it seems there are such big inequalities. But I think there's also quite a lot of research that says that women tend to be in those positions of power, tend to be more understanding and appreciative of gender issues in research allocations or funding allocations. Um, yeah, so that I mean that's that's one of the issues. So it's not it's not like a simple equation going on here, but it, it's a tendency, uh, and which one can think about in different ways. Is it wasting money? Put in that level, in sort of the economic case, is it unjust? Is it unrealized potential? But these things really affect. Well, they affect both the allocation of funding to different disciplines, if you like, you know, 
And of course, I would say that social sciences as a social science <laughs> lose out often uh, and humanities even more probably. But also it affects things like, you know, uh, the funding of individual projects and, and the funding of which kind of projects um, are, are seen as being uh, most appropriate and, and so on. So I think gatekeeping, gatekeeping is, is a useful concept to ask or think about whether you're looking at things sort of locally or in the whole of an institute or a whole department or whether I'm thinking about things nationally. And I mean, some national authorities, which comes from the government, usually in some point or other, so the ministries involved obviously are in, are in contact with the, um, the national science boards or whatever is the, you know, the national uh, allocating board. Um, you know, this is a very political issue. And in some cases you find more activity or more progress in this respect at the national level than you do actually at the, at the local level, because, you know, local, uh, well, local politics, we call it, I don't mean local politics in terms of city politics, but local politics operating in universities can be rather uh, autonomous, actually, in some cases, whereas at the national level, politicians sometimes are very involved in influencing, say, the Ministry of Education, which then influences the the, the uh, research council and so on. So these, these are the kind of dynamics I think are very important, but they vary tremendously across the world. That's the other thing to say. There's not some sort of fixed pattern, even if there's a tendency towards men being more present in decision-making and more definitely more present in chairing. But there's also, this is an academic issue as well. It's an academic content issue, not just about organizational uh, decision-making. That's the point I think. Okay, I have a couple of questions in English that they were written. Uh, the first one is from Daniel Prieto. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> what would you suggest as a possible strategy for reaching out and engaging more men into a proactive attitude towards change? Yeah, it's a very good question. And <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I said earlier that I got involved in this area, this broad area in the late 70s, and I got involved actually initially through what you might loosely call activism initially, or at least being in what was then a, a, a loosely you might call an anti-sexist men's group within academia, but then it moved outside academia, and then I got more involved in actually doing research on the topic and so on and so forth. But when I got involved in the late 70s, both more personally and, both, and also more academically, a bit, yeah, around 1980, I guess, these were really weird. They were really weird. They were thought to be really weird discussions. <laughs> and actually my, my PhD supervisor said to me, how can you study men? <laughs> Which sounds ridiculous. I mean, this is serious. So, Sometimes, you know, looking back at these things historically, they, they seem in the past strange, but now actually there's a lot, a lot of activity in this. And in terms of reaching out, well, I think one can think about it again at many levels. I mean, one can think about it in terms of talking to a friend, <laughs> talking to your, your so-called workmate in the next, next desk or the next computer or whatever. I mean, talking or talking to somebody not by making fun of feminism but by talking at, at, a, at a well these days we're all mainly working from home a lot of us are but in a social gathering I mean so there's this, this is everyday aspect I think but also there is increasingly organizing at the national and again I would say global level and the organization that I would and I always but often want to mention here, which I'm sure some of you know about, is called um, Men Engage Alliance, which is not an organization of men. <laughs> it's an organization of men, women, and further genders. And if you search Men Engage Alliance, you'll find a huge amount of activity. They were going to have, well, they did have an online conference last November, I think it was, but they got so many offerings, you might say, so many contributions that actually there are events online every other day, every week, two or three, sometimes four every week. 
under the name Men Men Engage Alliance and Ubuntu. Ubuntu, as you, as you know, is the African word for community or togetherness or whatever, whole together. So that's one obvious resource. But the other thing I would want to say that I'm actually also a little bit cautious. It's not about getting men engaged just for the sake of it to answer the questioner. It depends how many get engaged. And there are, there are dangers. There are certainly groups of men that I would definitely not support in terms of getting more engaged in this area, actually. So, I mean, I think one needs also to, to be realistic about the politics of some men who are definitely not pro-gender equality and definitely not pro-feminism who want to get engaged in gender debates. And that's really clear in some parts of the world. Okay, Jeff, we ha I have like two questions that are kind of related. One is from Sonia Rodriguez and the other one from Nadia Riera. Sonia says, do you know of any academic institution that has changed the evaluation parameters to promote a change in men and masculinities? Maybe evaluating how they promote women within their groups or other positive actions for gender balance? And Nadia says, how can we further engage academic institutions to promote this view of gender equality? What actions can we expect or can be done? Many times this effort, these efforts in this regard are taken as a distraction from the real science. Yeah, I, I, found, it hard, I found it hard to hear the first part of what you were saying actually, but uh, sorry, the, the, it was the, uh, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that, it was the distortion on the technology. Oh. Yeah, okay. I think, so yeah, so maybe you could re repeat sorry. briefly, sorry, oh. yeah, sorry. One was uh, requesting for an example of any institution having changed the criteria, the criteria. Yeah, yeah, of the yeah. And okay, yeah. yeah, I can, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the easiest way, uh, if you want a specific example, is actually to, uh, for me to email the person or, or you on this actually, but I mean, there are definitely examples the ones that come to mind immediately without thinking to are from Norway, actually, uh, where there's been attempts to look at uh, recruitment in a very different way in some universities. I mean, one basic issue is, and also in, in not only in Norway, but I'm just thinking al aloud here, but also the, the basic idea when you have shortlists, not to have men only shortlists, for instance, I'm not that, that doesn't solve the problem, but at least to insist even, even when you're appointing uh, professorships, chairs, things like the highest level, that uh, all shortlists uh, have to include, uh, well, in this case, women and men. Yeah, that's, that's one thing. Um, and then there are other attempts also to look at, in a sense, uh, rather than looking at, say, the whole of a CV with, you know, 300 entries, you know, to actually look uh, at the so-called... Uh, what the candidate selects as the, the best um, publications, you know, five or six or 10. So it's not about quantity, it's about quality. There's obviously also big issues about um, the question of how one takes account of uh, people's early careers, in, including uh, childbirth for, for women, obviously, as well. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of examples of this kind. That's what the questioner was asking about. But also, I mean, uh, there's a lot more than that one can do, I think, in terms of what is often called structural change in, in universities and higher education. And this is a major set of initiatives which are basically being promoted, certainly in the European Commission, uh, under the various initiatives. So if people want information on this, um, I don't know where it's best to communicate with Victoria, probably on this, I can send more information, but some of this is um, pretty well documented in, in different places, yeah. Um, and of course the, yeah, the, I mean, the European Commission has a lot of information on this and a lot of projects um, on this, including for instance, one project that looks at resistance, specifically resistance to gender equality in academia. So it's not only the sort of pro side, but also looking at how resistance is, is done and how to resist the resistance, if that makes sense. So we have time for one more question. We we will have we have we are receiving more questions and Jeff has been kind enough to accept. We will email the questions that are left over and he will yeah. try reply in writing. So thanks I'll for that. I will try. I will try. <laughs> and then we will ask the last, the last question. question. Yeah. 
Matias Machado from YouTube asks, is homosociality related to men treating more equally a woman that behaves as a man, like in a power position? Yeah, I didn't hear. Sorry, I heard sort of that. <laughs> maybe Victoria. No, it's not your. It's not you. It's it's maybe it may be where the mic is. Yeah, sorry. It's like is homosociality related to is homosociality related to men treating more equally a woman that behaves as a man, like in a power position? It's about. Okay, I think I understand. So is homosociality related to how a woman behaves more like a man? Is how, that what yeah. how I think it's how men treat more equally a woman that behaves like a man. It's not. You said you said I think uh, in, I'm interpreting, but I think no, God, yeah. You said that men feel more comfortable around men, right? Often, often, yeah. It's one particularly heterosexual men, particularly show being heterosexual by spending time with men. Yeah, in yeah, guess, men in different places. Yeah. I guess the question turns back to the issue again, asking about the behavior of women, whether whether men feel more comfortable or how they treat women who behave more like manly, or if you can say something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not sure. As my, I mean, my instant reaction is I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, really. If the question is asking men who are more homosocial, do they treat women who behave more like men in a more, in more friendly way? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's also good to say you don't, don't know. That's, that's my feeling. I, I would need to think about this a bit more. I mean, to me, in some ways, this is a kind of... It's an empirical question in one sense, and one would need to look at empirical studies of this specifically, I, I think, uh, rather than there being like an iron law. You know what I mean? That, that's the way I would react. And one's got to be really careful about generalizing from studies, say, from the US or from Northern Europe to other parts of the world. So I, I would need to think about this more carefully. I mean, maybe when I send these comments on the other questions, I could have come up with something. but. It, it would, need yeah. quite, it would need quite careful research to actually do it as well. And what is meant by women behaving more like men, if that was the phrase if understood, which, yeah. it, which is a bit of a problematic term, perhaps. Um, although, yeah, yeah, that would need a bit of deconstructing, as we as would say, a bit, a bit of discussion, what is meant by that, actually, I think, yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. So... It's good to end on a don't know, I think, sometimes. <laughs> No, I guess I guess it, we we keep thinking about this, and I, I think it probably goes back to the main question: what what is yeah. to be a man, and what is to be manly, and what mm -hmm. is a manly man, and what is a manly woman? I mean, I mean, I didn't talk much about how women behave, which is, I mean, I'm sure yeah. you're having the sessions on that. I mean, the other thing I perhaps I would say is that there are clearly many different ways in which women can also act as, as, as leaders or managers or as rectors as well. And I'm thinking here, but very sort of specifically, I mean, I, part of my, I'm emeritus in a business school, although I'm also in gender studies in Sweden. And there is a small business school in Helsinki. And the last three rectors, in fact, the current and the previous two are all women in a business school. And that's quite unusual, I think, internationally, if you know. This is the overall rector. And obviously they're, <laughs> they're all different and different in their style of, of managing, if you understand. Uh, I won't go through that, that'd be inappropriate. But all three have had a very different way of being women rectors, even though, you know, on, in terms of the, the national, international figures, that is a minority, but it happens in that institution where I happen to have been working. It, that's been the, the pattern for the last, uh, 20 years or, or so, actually. So that's why I'm being a little bit cautious about what does that mean for a woman yeah. to behave like a man, actually. Yeah, yes. Okay, uh, this has been great. I thank you again. And on behalf of, of everyone here, yeah. I, I think uh, we're very grateful and happy with this talk. Excellent, so, Chef. Thank you so <laughs> much for taking the time to be with us. Well, you're very uh, welcome. And um, thank you. Yeah, and uh, obviously it's 
it's good to keep talking, but not just talking, but doing things as well, as you know. Talking is part of doing, but also talking also leads on to doing as well, hopefully. Yeah. Very yeah. yeah. good. And we'll be in touch as well on these things. I will send some of these PowerPoints to you a bit edited uh, in the next uh, 24 hours or so. Is that okay? Yeah, very yes. good. Thank good. you very much. Thank you. Can I thank Silvana Pereira yes. particularly, honestly, because um, I know I said before this started, I'm always amazed how translators actually do the do it. They have to have at least two, if not three, brains. So thank you, Silvana. Yes, yes. Thank you, and thank you, Silvana, and thank you to the uh, Intendencia de Montevideo who financed this, uh, this translation. Yeah. translation. Okay. So thank you so yeah. much. Thank you all. Thank You're you welcome. All. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.